Hi, welcome to Writing Well, part of the Biodefense Capstone course. Today's agenda, three parts. First, a brief statement on the importance of writing well. Second, and the main focus of our discussion today, the three pillars of great papers. Finally, a little strategy for making sure you write a great paper, outlining. Okay, a brief unnecessary statement about why great writing is important. You've been harped at it, uh, about it for your whole life probably, but the reason is because it's true. It's important. But it's not as important for other people as it is for you. You all, by virtue of the fact that you're in the program that you're in, are people who are going to be judged professionally by your writing. Unless you happen to be a quant jock or a scientist, and we don't have too many of those in our program, a few, if you're like the bulk of us, though, all the great thinking you do, all the research you do, all the analysis you do can be fantastic. But the only way people are going to know it's fantastic if, if, is if the writing you do to explain it is also fantastic. So if you want better grades, if you want better jobs, if you want fame, glory, or money, your writing is going to have to be fantastic. I want this to be a calling card for you. I want people to think you're indispensable. And the way for them to think that is for them to appreciate your writing. So let's get, let's get to it. How do we do that? A few pillars. First, it all starts with the introduction. And that is your summary introduction. That which will begin every paper you ever write, every memo you ever write, every anything analytical or academic scholarly that you ever write. The summary introduction is critical for several reasons. The first and foremost, not foremost, just the first, is that it makes your first impression. Just like anything, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. People, like with books, they decide if the cover is something they like, they read the first page, if it's something like they keep going. The same thing is true with a journal article or a book uh, that you might write. It's going to make your first impression. Do you seem professional? Do you seem smart? Do you seem interesting? Does your argument seem interesting and novel? Uh, you don't, if, it, if you come out with your best stuff on page 30, most people aren't going to get there unless you made page one just as interesting. So make your first impression well. Second is it helps set your reader's expectations. What are you doing here? Why are we here? Um, you know, I need to judge the whole thing on some basis. So tell me what basis I'm judging on. If you say it's an article about X, I will judge it on that basis. If you say your, your mission is to do Y, I will judge it on that basis. So that's really important. Third, set the hook. Um, I kind of stomped on this one by talking about the first impression, but what I mean here is really, you know, is this something I want to read? You have to put that right on the first couple of paragraphs. You have, to, you have to frame your issue in a juicy, interesting way. Even if you've been asked to write it by a boss, um, bosses ask for a lot of stuff they never look at later. You need to make it clear to them that what you've just done is important. And so th that's the real hook that I'm talking about. Your paper is really important, but you've got to prove it. No one else thinks that until you prove it. So prove it. Fourth bit is another critical mission of the summary introduction is to help your readers understand what you're saying and agree with it. Right? You're making an argument here. You want them to understand it so they can agree with it. That's your goal. Your introduction is a very powerful tool to help get you there. And lastly, and this is the process part of it, right? to do those four bullet points, you need your summary introduction to answer the seven questions that both Stephen Van Evra and Teresa Johnson articulate in their papers. And I, well, I think Steve has six and Teresa has seven, but they're, they're the same questions. And let me just run over those real quick and the importance of each of them. Right? The first, most obvious, is what question or questions do you address? You know, we have to know what your paper is about. The second is why does your question arise? Right? So what? Is it because something's burning on the other side of the world that needs fixing? Is it because scholars are unclear about something? Why exactly does this arise. The third is what answer or answers do you offer? Right? If you've studied the problem and you come up with an answer, you can't wait till page 30 to tell us the answer. You have to tell it to us in the introduction. And I'm pretty sure most of you at this point in your careers have figured out that that's the way it works. But typically, uh, even with undergrads and, and new writers, this is a learning experience. We, we have to learn that uh, you have to begin at the end and then explain how you got there. I always, in talking about this uh, make the analogy with the prosecutor's opening statement before the judge and the jury. Your Honor, 
you know, members of the jury, today we're going to prove that Colonel Mustard killed Mr. Plum in the kitchen with a wrench because Mr. Plum slept with Colonel Mustard's wife. We're, we have video evidence, we have the testimony from bystanders, we have DNA and confession, and at the end of the day, we're going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you must convict Mr. Plum or Mr. Mustard, Colonel Mustard, for first degree murder. Right? The prosecutor does not wait till two weeks into the trial to say who they think did it. Right? That would be ridiculous because how would the jury make sense of all the information they're getting if they don't know who you think did it and why and what their argument is? You have to spell all that out up front. Then I can judge the evidence you provide based on how well it makes the case. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're saying what our case is, then we're making it, and at the end, you judge us. That's how this works. So you have to say what your answer is up front. Don't hide it, right? The fourth question is, why does your answer matter, right? It's not enough that it's true. A lot of things are true that I don't care about. What you need to be doing is telling people, hey, here's my answer, and it's really important because the things you thought we should be doing are all wrong, right? Or, you know, we're spending money we shouldn't spend, or we're invading the wrong country, or we don't need to invade that country because if my analysis is correct, you know, that sort of thing. So why does your answer matter? The fifth question is, what competing arguments do you refute? So, for example, you might argue that I think, yeah, you know, there are three arguments about, um, uh, you know, whether the metro should expand in D.C. I agree with group A for the following reasons, but groups B and C are out to lunch, right? So tell us who you agree with, tell us who you disagree with. That's important, especially for scholars and, you know, in political parties or in bureaucracies, you know, what part of your organization is right, which part is wrong, which party is right, which party is wrong. This is the stuff of, you know, our real world. And that's, again, what people care about a lot here. So it's helping people set the hook. It's helping people understand that this is interesting, important, and so on. Sixth question, how will you reach your answers? You always have to give a snapshot of your methods here because your analysis is only as credible as your methods. And so people are going to want to know, is this a quantitative study? Is this a qualitative study? Did you do this over 10 years? Did you write it on the back of an envelope? Right? How serious they're going to take you depends on what kind of methods you bring to the table. So you're going to want to do a, a careful job of previewing your methods. They'll read more later, but you're going to preview right in the beginning. And then the last one is, how will your article be organized? This is another one where newer writers often fail to provide even the simplest of roadmaps to their paper. But every paper has to have a roadmap. Again, not for you. You're writing it. You know the organization. It's for me, the reader. I don't know the organization. And I will have a much easier time digesting what's about to come if you tell me exactly what to expect. It's basic human psychology. But again, it's a learned habit as a writer. You don't think like this when you're just thinking about the topic on your own. And the trick here is that you're starting to move from being a consumer of information into a producer of information. And now you need to start thinking about your audience as the customer. What do I need to do to make the customer happy? And the customer is not happy if they don't understand what's going on or if they feel lost in the middle of your paper. So a summary introduction is critical and this roadmap is critical so they know exactly what to expect. Ah, there's going to be an introduction. There's a background summary. There's a data and method set and so on. Right? So, and if you look at international security, which I encourage you to do, you will see that without fail, every single one of them ends with a roadmap paragraph. It's not a fancy paragraph. It's just, it just bluntly tells you exactly the organization of the paper at a, at a fairly high level. Now, for a little bit of extra help with how to write a summary introduction, what does it look like when you do these different jobs of answering these questions, you can look at the other document I put in the week's content and that is the marked up version of a paper I wrote a while back called The Myth of the Outside Strategy. And what you'll be reading is a marked up draft copy. And that marked up draft actually looks a lot like formatting wise. Um, well, it is. It's, I think, the version I sent to the journal um, for review. And that's the general format that your articles will take. Um, you know, not formatted like it the journal, but the way we can do it ourselves. And so what I've done is I've inserted comments all along to show you where I'm doing the different jobs that are required in your summary introduction. And then actually beyond that as well, um, some of the other, uh, like how to do the literature review and stuff, I've, I've also made comments on. So that's, that's out there for you as well. Okay. All right. So that's pillar one. Um, and I can't tell you how many times it's um, a really good diagnostic tool for me, the professor, if I read a summary introduction that, well, A, doesn't exist. Uh, B, 
has lots of gaps, I then I know that I'm not going to be happy. Um, if it doesn't tell me the answer that the person is getting to, if I don't know the punchline, that's that's one of the biggest red flags. So um, it's really a good diagnostic tool for me. And because of that, it's also a good diagnostic tool for you. If you read your own summary introduction and you don't see it, you know you're not done writing and polishing your paper. Also, as a side note, when I am conceptualizing new work, I often start by trying to write a summary introduction. Um, can I write a hook that's interesting enough? Can I frame, do I have it framed in my mind in a way that is, I can answer these questions thoroughly and in an interesting way that gets me excited about the article? Um, and if I can't, then I know, if, you know, if, usually I'll get part way through it and start running out of steam and I'll go, oh, no, not so much, not this, this is terrible. Um, but the articles where I've really had the most success, um, I start writing it and it kind of starts to write itself and I know exactly the data and methods I'm going to use, and I, right? And so it's a good diagnostic. Um, one, one last bit is that typically though, you know, you can't write the final summary introduction until you're done because, you know, after all, you don't know the answer until you're done doing all the research. You don't know all the implications of your argument. You might not have a, a full list of the, you know, groups that you agree and disagree with and all that sort of thing. So very often, your summary your introduction will evolve quite a bit from the first version you write in a draft to a final version. But the, the general rule is the same. The goal is to guide the reader and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so on to pillar two, smart sections. Um, and, you know, apologize in advance. This sounds like um, very basic stuff, but um, my experience in, in uh, working with students at every level is that Again, making this transition from I'm the consumer and all I do is care about the content to a producer where not only are you responsible for the content, but you're also responsible for how well people understand it, right? This, this is an unnatural thing. It's not of something you're born with is, is the ability or the, not the ability, but the habit of mind. We're not inbred with the habit of mind of thinking about how other, people's are, are, other people are engaging our work and understanding it. And so you need to be very explicit with yourself about making it easy for people to read your papers. And that's exactly what sections are for. Sections help people follow your arguments. Let's try a simple thought experiment. Imagine taking a book, um, let's say a book that's 250 pages long, not even a very long book. Now let's imagine that uh, we printed it on one very long piece of paper. We got rid of all the paragraphs all the indentations, and we single-spaced it. How easy would that be to follow? That would be brutal, right? No page numbers, no paragraphs, no sections, no chapters, just one long block of text. Well, that's a sort of a, you know, ha, 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 that stupid, right? But that the point that I'm trying to make with this obvious example is that the format matters a lot for the eventual understanding of the work. Now notice that none of the content changed just because we did that. The content still is good or as bad as it ever was. But your ability to know whether it's good or bad is transformed completely by taking it from that basically unreadable block of text and chunking it up into sections that make sense and help you, the reader, digest it as you go. So smart sections, by smart sections, I mean a few fairly specific things that I'd like to see in all of your papers. You know, at the most basic level, obviously, they help separate passages that are focused on discrete topics. So every time you move from one topic to another, you should consider whether or not you need a new section. Of course, there's got to be a limit on how many sections you have, because imagine doing the opposite thought experiment, taking every sentence and putting a, a, a section heading over it. Well, you know, you'd pretty much double the length of the, of the thing, and you'd actually make it harder to understand. So that's not the goal. But I, once we get down a little ways in the presentation, I think that will become a little more obvious. But um, so anyways, um, in particular, though, a smart section has a title that does what we call extra work. And Teresa Johnson talks about this very nicely in her paper. But basically, rather than just giving a bland section title that's just super descriptive, but not uh, clearly explaining what the point is, you want a section heading that does some extra work. So for example, let's imagine I'm um, uh, writing a paper about building the bridge to nowhere. And I am writing the literature review on that and I have identified three different um, uh, critiques of the bridge to nowhere. Economic critiques, political critiques, and engineering critiques, right? 
And it turns out, you know, it's going to be too expensive and nobody supports it. And it's actually physically impossible to build. So the, those are the three basic arguments, right? So imagine my literature view. I could, the different ways I might organize it. First, I might title the main section literature view. Eh, it's a little boring. It doesn't do a lot of extra work, but you know, literature is a fairly, you know, common thing. I think we all pretty much get that. And we know the topic of the paper is bridge to nowhere. So that, that's fine. That's okay. It could be better, but it's fine. But now let's imagine we're reviewing those all the work done ma that makes those three different arguments. Well, if I had the main section literature review and then had no sections underneath, I'm not helping the reader very much, right? Because I'm, I'm get, not giving them any cues as to when I'm talking about, you know, one um, kind of argument versus another. I haven't cued them in that I'm switching from one to another and so on and so on. That's not very good. Don't do that. Right? Okay, I need sections. I need subsections. So underneath literature review, I have three sections. I could name them very simply, section one, section two, and section three. Oh, but I've missed a big opportunity there. That's a little more helpful because at least I'm, as a reader, I'm cued to, okay, topic change, you know, and because it's a subsection, I know we're still doing literature review, but now we're swifting from one topic to another. But because your subsections, uh, headings didn't tell me what the topic was, you missed a chance to really make it easier. Instead, right, you're going to want a section heading that says uh, the political case against the bridge to nowhere. Nobody wants it, right? No, not, notice, notice what I did there. It's not just the political literature, the economic literature, the engineering literature. No, no. Have the section heading be explicit and do extra work. Have it encapsulate the main point of that section if you can. Some sections lend themselves to this more easily than others, but in this case, it's pretty easy. Right? You can say politics, nobody wants the bridge to nowhere. Economics, can't afford the bridge to nowhere. Engineering, just can't be done. And then you review the work under each of those, but you've made it very easy for the reader to do it. Plus, it's actually more interesting too. It's more interesting when people take the time to put a little effort in to make those titles do extra work. Fourth tip here is that every section and subsection should begin with a section introduction. So. Um, for example, uh, in the Bridge to Nowhere uh, example, you could say, in this literature review uh, on the Bridge to Nowhere research, I identify the three main arguments about the Bridge to Nowhere, the economic, the political, and the engineering. Boom. Then you go into your subsections. See how easy that was? Now, you, now as you give it a good title, literature review, the Bridge to Nowhere, you know, everyone hates it but then you told me exactly what I could expect, right? That's like the opening statement of the prosecutor. Now I know what you want me to be thinking about. You want me to think about the three separate things. That's why I know what sections are coming up. Every time I see a subsection, I will link it to the fact that you told me that's what you're doing. Life is gonna be good. Now, sometimes a section introduction could be a few sentences to, because it might be a complicated section. Sometimes it might be a subsection that's small enough that you don't even really need one. I suggest you write it there in your draft, and then when you read back through, you can either shrink it, or in some cases with a sub subsection, you could you, know, you maybe be able to delete it if it if it's just not necessary, right? And then the <clears throat> the last thing that we'll talk about, especially when I get to the outlining section, is that every a smart section is one that is well organized internally. So if you think about each section having a main task, right, the organization of that section then has to be organized to optimize doing that task, whatever it might be. And so I won't get into too much detail, but when we get to the outlining section, we'll talk a little bit more about how to make sure you're doing that. Okay, pillar three, good writing, right? We sort of started here. Now it's time to talk a little bit about what makes writing professional grade. Um, this is not a course on writing. I'm not, you know, here to, you know, I'm here to give you one last chance to make sure you are pushing yourself towards professional writing. I am not going to, you know, make you, um, you know, read six books on on good writing. I, I find that useful because the better writer you are, the better life is. But um, here's just some things that I'm expecting out of your papers this term. So I want to make it real clear what my expectations are. First, your writing should be clear. Remember that the goal of an academic or an analyst is to lay bare and make transparent what is going on in the world the connection between A and B, the causes and consequences of different things going on in the world. Um, your job is not to create new terms and phrases, to obfuscate, to make things more complex. That's the job of sociologists and philosophers. That's not our job, right? We want to make things simple. So what your job is is to take what is inevitably, in all of your cases, a complex topic 
and make it easy to understand for civilians. And, you know, Stephen Van Ever, who wrote the How to Write a Paper thing, I think he says it in there, right? Your target audience really should be like a junior in college. If a junior in college can read your paper and, and get a good sense, I mean, they may not understand all the technical, you know, analysis that you did, but if they can understand your English, that and you've done your job. And remember, too, that even within whatever organization you were in, be it DOD or CIA or, you know, any think tank or whatever, your boss is very likely, you know, your boss's boss's boss, who I mean the top person who might end up reading a memo is not an expert on your topic, right? They're relying on you to be the expert. And the higher up the food chain you go, the less expert they are. And so the more careful you need to be to be very clear, jargon-free, acronym-free wherever possible, and make, don't add complexity, try to reduce complexity. Okay, one of the ways to be clear is to be concise. And so concise writing is much clearer by definition, but it's also, you know, more concise. And in today's world, in any world, people have a lot of things they would like to do. And the less time they have to spend reading to get the point, the better. So, you know, general rule of thumb is everything you write should be as short as possible while still doing the job that you are doing. So if your job is to answer a question X and you can do it in 20 pages, don't take 30 right? That makes no sense. And don't write because you knew stuff. Don't, don't write stuff down just because you're proud you know it now, right? We all, that happens to all of us. You're doing research for a project, you learn 10, 50, 100 times more things that ever end up going into the paper. And a very big temptation for people is to include it because they know it, whether they're trying to show off or they sound smart or they just, it pains you to not have it in there because it's, you sweat it over, you know, a graph or a chart or whatever. And you found out, you realized sort of at the end, it, it wasn't really the main point, but you just, you just, too hurt to leave it out, guess what? Drop it. It'll all be useful to you later at some point probably, but it's not useful now because your reader's time is what you're trying to, you know, maximize the use of. So don't, don't keep it in, keep it out. So my advice here is that it's very hard to write short. In fact, that's one of the hardest things. So don't worry about it up front. Write your first draft as long as it takes you to say, you know, because a lot of times I'll end up typing something three times longer than it has to be because I'm, I'm just not sure as I'm typing that first draft how to say it. And so just type it as long as it needs to be at first. But then when you reread it, right, go through and try to be ruthless about cutting out extra words. Say everything as short as you can and see how it goes. All right. Um, the third thing is that you need to be professional. Your writing needs to be professional. And by this, I typically mean that it needs to follow whatever conventions apply in your world. And for the most part, for most of you, that's going to be the kind of conventions that apply in the journals that we're reading. And in particular, obviously, you're writing this for a particular audience. You're writing it for me. You're writing it for a journal. And so you should write like you're writing in a journal. And so in particular, take note of things that don't happen in those journals. There's no slang. There's no, well, I feel like. There's no informal writing. Write like they do in the journals. That's a good rule of thumb. And, you know, sometimes you might work in an organization that has some even more specific requirements around what is professional writing, and you will obey those. That's fine. But uh, remember, we want people to think you're a rock star, so you should follow whatever the um, conventions of being a rock star are. And the last bullet point is that no matter where you work, one of the conventions of being a rock star is that your stuff is perfect. And by perfect, I, I specifically mean your spelling, your grammar, and the beauty and presentation of your material. So th there's no excuse for spelling errors in the modern era. I mean, come on. Do you, we all know what spell check is. Grammar, same thing. The Microsoft Word is pretty darn good at grammar checking too. Moreover, anything really important like this or something for work where your boss is reading stuff, you ought to have someone read it who is reading to make sure you don't say anything that sounds dumb or fuzzy or wrong. Um, and sure as heck, no spelling errors, uh, no typos, Page number. I mean, what, what's this with not putting page numbers on things? Can you imagine having a book and trying to work with other people and say, hey, you see that graph? Oh, where is it? Ah, it's in the middle somewhere. Like, what's that? That's ridiculous. Page numbers, guys. That's easy, right? No problem. So yeah, label all your tables and figures. Make sure people, again, think of this. The reason the writing matters is because your audience matters. That's why we write. We write to be understood. And the only way you can be understood and eventually appreciated and rewarded is if people think you're doing a really good job. And every time people see a typo, a spelling error, a grammatical error especially, sloppiness of any kind, people immediately knock you down a few pegs in their assessment of you as a professional. That's just part of the game. And so 
you want to be taken seriously, your writing needs to be serious. All right, that's my stern warning on professional grade writing. Uh, all right, some bonus material for you. Uh, outlining for success. This is um, possibly something you already do and you feel like you're a complete pro at. So if I start talking on the next slide and this sounds overly familiar to you, please feel free to you know give it a pass. But um, this is just going to introduce you to the way I work and how I outline. Um, I learned this many years ago in grad school. And as your work gets more complex longer, it's easier to lose track of where you are. It's easier for it to be difficult to figure out how to organize your paper and for thus the writing of your paper to take longer than you want. So outlining turns out to be a great way and, and not just for your writing but also for organizing the research process as well. So let's start and the way we want to start is with a high level outline, the highest level and you know that's easy because every paper that you're going to write is probably going to follow a very similar high level outline. Intro, reviewer background, data methods, findings and analysis, recommendations, conclusions. And the thing that's nice about this is that you have a, a task that you've just gotten done and it didn't take much effort at all. But it's nice to get a little feeling of accomplishment. And you can remind yourself that these are the themes, or I'm sorry, the 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 tracks of effort that you're going to be doing. You know, these are the swim lanes. You're going to be working on the introduction. You're going to be working on the literature stuff, right? And each of these is going to have its own set of tasks. They're relatively independent of one another, so that you can kind of divide up, hey, day one, I'm going to work on this, and another day, I'm going to work on that. You can write them up separately, too, as you're drafting and so on. So it's nice to just have that established, right? But then you got to start taking it to the next level. And so the next thing you want to do is create a high-level outline for each section. And again, you might not work on them all at once. You don't need to sit down and create you know, a high-level outline for all five or six sections all at one go because you might not be able to. Right At the beginning, you probably can't because you don't you know exactly what each section is going to look like yet. But for the introduction, we actually always know because it always has to answer the same seven questions. So a high-level outline for intro, you just cut and paste this into every introduction you know, outline you ever do. Um, Sometimes the pros, uh, you know, play a little bit with the order of this, but, you know, frankly, not a lot. I mean, there's not that much wiggle room. If you look, you'll see this is kind of the order in which these things logically get answered because that's just the way our brains work. And so, um, you know, you might, for example, start with your answer. You might, you know, start off, I argue that China will not rise peacefully. I think John Mearsheimer started his article like that recently. So that's great. But then he basically followed the same format and re-explain what his answer was a little bit later in the introduction. So you've got your high-level introduction uh, outline, boom, already to go. And so you should do the same for each section as you can. So again, you know what things it is you need to go do. So for the introduction, you know you need to go figure out answers to all those questions, write them down, and eventually, you know, they're going to become your introduction section. Let's look at another example. This is your literature review, right? So imagine you're studying um, the uh, question of whether or not to expand the DC Metro to uh, create a lot more lines and more stops because, you know, it just doesn't, my biggest complaint, frankly, it doesn't go enough places, right? So, so let's say you're writing about that. And so your literature review, what's that outline going to look like? Well, um, the first thing you know, because we just talked about this in our smart sections discussion, is that every section has got to have a section introduction. So that's the first big bullet point you can do for your literature review section is, I know it has to have a section introduction. Bing, done. Um, and then you know from your initial reading of the debates and the journal articles and whatnot is that there are kind of two flavors of argument going on about it. There's the political side of the question and then there's the economic side of the question. And so oh, there's two other high level bullets, right? I'm gonna review the political stuff, boop, bullet point, then I'm gonna review the economic stuff, boop, bullet point. And then um, another bullet point you might add is a sort of a summary conclusion of all of your lit review to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of these previous analyses so that you can set up the reader to understand why your work is necessary. See, the political people argued about this and that and the other thing and the economics they argued about, but they forgot to talk about this and that, right? So as you critique their weaknesses, what you're doing is you're telling people, hey, here's the gaps in the literature. That's what my paper is going to fix. Right? So this would be your high-level outline of the literature review section. And again, in terms of like your own agenda for getting stuff done, you might say, okay, Monday I'm going to write down, I'm going to read all the stuff on the political stuff. Tuesday I'm going to write down all the stuff on the internet. Thursday I'm going to write all the discussion of strength and weaknesses. Right? So it helps you organize yourself. Right? Then 
we have to create a more detailed outline for the section. And so you might pause for a minute and read through and then listen to me describe this. But here, what I've done <laughs> is I've taken the section introduction, and since that doesn't have any more sub sections to go, I actually just wrote down a section introduction. And so, you know, though previous analyses have provided useful insights, none have settled the debate over metro expansion. In this section, I critique the political and economic analyses that have been conducted to date and identify what analysis is necessary to resolve the issue. So, you know, what I've done there pretty simply is let the reader know exactly what they're going to get out of this section. I'm going to review the politics and the economics, and I'm going to critique it to tell you what's missing and what needs to be done. Bing. Good. Um, then I've got my higher bullet points then broken down into smaller ones. So the blue stuff here, which is I'm going to talk about on the next slide, that's why it's blue. Um, so review of political analyses. And then under that, I've got analyses that are supportive of expansion, and I've got analyses that are critical of expansion. And I've bullet pointed a couple of arguments, specifically each, and then in parentheses you can see the authors that have made those. So I'm starting to really organize my research using this outline. Critical, I have the same sort of thing. Then for economic, same thing. I've got pro and con, or supportive and critical, and I've got the specific arguments, and you can see the authors that are going to be talked about, and so on. Right. So this takes you down to a level where you're getting really clear about what's going to be in this literature review section. Right? At this point, someone reading this goes, okay, yeah, I mean, geez, I know, like, this could be a PowerPoint slide on this topic, right? I mean, if you think about it, that's what PowerPoint slides are, is like, well, there's a high level thing, and then there's like, here's why people support expansion. You've got the bullet points there already. Huh, that's interesting. Well, that's good. Well, then there's one level more you need to take it, I think, before you actually start writing. And so you see the blue section here. I'm going to take a slide where we just look at how to span that, right? And so this is review of political analyses. And we're just looking at the supportive expansion piece, right? And um, one of the bullet points under the supportive one was the concept of providing more opportunities to poor communities. And I said, eh, right? So um, then the goal here is to actually write a topic sentence of each specific bullet point, right? So for the subsection of providing more opportunities, that's one of the arguments in favor of expansion. I have um, the Johnson study, and he makes two good points. It's point A, and I'm going to summarize this in a topic sentence. Johnson argues that the experience from Chicago illustrates the benefit of metro expansion for poor communities, right? And so uh, that is the topic sentence of a paragraph in my literature review. The rest of the paragraph will explain what he means and why he thinks that, right? And then point B under this says, Johnson argues that cities have a moral duty to their poorest citizens and that metro expansion can help fulfill that duty. Then I would finish explaining that point. And then boom, that part of the literature review is done. So do you see what you do? Now you are basically, you've gotten your literature review, your, your outline now, down to the point where pretty much what you can do is sit down at your computer and just type the rest of that in pretty easily from your notes. It's, you've got it so well organized and so tidy that you're going to have no trouble at all. And, you know, a lot of people feel constrained by outline. They feel like, oh, this is too, you know, too much organization and so on. And, and I, I totally understand that, um, that tension. That sometimes people feel like this is too uh, rigid, a process, this outlining process, and that it kind of kills their creativity. And, and what I would say to that is that it is certainly true that for some topics, uh, some parts of different papers, uh, the outlining can be uh, premature if you haven't thought things through all the way. And so this is, it's a bit, it's an art, not a science. So what you have to figure out is, are you at a place where what you need to do is brainstorm and be creative? In which case, you might want to take blank pieces of paper and just kind of give yourself a prompt and say, all right, what do I think and what are some points here? And then you distill from that bullet points that you will then organize into your paper um, versus times when you think you pretty much already know the work that needs to be done, at which point you might as well just put it, the bullet points down there, and that can kind of be your agenda for going and getting the work of the paper done. So at any rate, I can recommend fully the outlining process since I use it myself. And again, it will be much easier um, when you're writing a long paper if things are relatively more organized rather than less because uh, as the number of sort of bits and parts uh, expands, the difficulty of keeping it straight in your mind just 
goes up exponentially. And so I think you'll be much happier and things will be um, you know, much stronger generally if you start from an outline. Okay, that's it. Good luck with all of that. And I look forward to seeing you online.